So Western magic was a big influence. Kabbalah was a big influence. There's also the Templar, Masonic, Rosicrucian influence. Each of these deserves its own lecture. Um, and I really can't do it justice. But many magical groups contemporary with Crowley when he was living, they derive from 18th and 19th century secret societies like the Freemasons, which I'm sure you've heard of, and the Rosicrucians. So some aspirants, especially those who join OTO, uh, OTO is very heavily, very heavily influenced by the symbolism of Freemasonry and of course the Rosicrucians. So many find it useful to go back and read about Freemasonry and learn the heritage. Um, Crowley was someone who liked to update things, kind of give the 2.0 version, and he often, he basically made OTO the 2.0 or new eon version of Freemasonry in his view. Uh, so another order that I should mention is the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Crowley joined this in 1899 or so. It was an English secret society. Uh, and it focused on occult philosophy, and it was based on initiations that were founded on the symbolism of the Tree of Life. Imagine that. Uh, so each initiation, you're basically in a different sphere, moving up the Tree of Life, and slowly attaining, theoretically. Um, Crowley derives an immense amount of his symbolic language from the Golden Dawn, and the Golden Dawn derives an immense amount of its symbol symbolic language from Freemasonry, Kabbalah, and Western magic. You can see all, all these things kind of influence each other. There was a huge cluster jam in the early 1900s of all these kinds of things. Many people were, were studying these things. So there's also Hermeticism and Gnosticism. Uh, many magical and theurgical traditions of second century Greece coalesced in various forms as Gnosticism, uh, Neoplatonism and Hermeticism. Probably you've heard of some of these, um, but they are basically these kind of Hellenistic uh, ancient Greek philosophies that were formed as syncretisms of many other philosophies. Uh, there was a few texts that influenced Crowley greatly. One of them was called the Chaldean Oracles. Uh, Chaldean Oracles was translated by Win William Wynne Westcott, who was one of the founders of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. A lot of incestual relations there, right? So he created this text and input it in, into the various rituals of the Golden Dawn. So Crowley was influenced by the text itself as well as by the rituals he went through that were influenced by the text. Um, and you'll find various references to the Chaldean oracles throughout various of Crowley's texts, even in uh, certain holy books of Philema, Chaldean oracle, oracles show up. Um, also, there's something called the Goetia, which has, it's about summoning demons, and it's somewhat of a grimoire, but the beginning of it has something called the Preliminary Invocation, also known as the Bornless One, or Invocation of the Bornless One, or Invocation of the Headless One, depends on who you're reading, um, but it actually comes from the Greco-Egyptian Magical Papyri that we were in the British Museum, so it's a, a very old tradition. Uh, Crowley would thought that the Bornless Invocation was so important that he reworked it into something called Libra Samek, which is a ritual to try to attain knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, this kind of central task of magic. At least that's one way to frame it. So the main way that Gnosticism influenced Crowley is this idea of Gnosis. Gnosis means knowledge. So when someone says they're an agnostic, they're actually saying they're without knowledge, technically, literally. Um, but a Gnostic is someone who has knowledge, who has Gnosis. And Gnosis is specifically direct experiential knowledge, not just intellectual knowledge or things that you can put into words, really. It's that, that direct experience specifically of the divine. This was very influential on Crowley, especially because of the idea that you don't need a priest or something to interpret God for you or through which you approach God. You approach directly. Uh, this, this also fits in with scientific illuminism, if you think about it, right? So there's no need to take other people's word for it. You, yourself, if any claim is made, you say, well, I'll do it for myself, and I'll see how it works, and then I'll determine if it's true or not, at least for me. Uh, various Gnostic texts, and a little side note, um, there were a group of Gnostic texts 
that were around in the late 1800s. So they didn't have all the, the Gnostic texts that we have now, right? All this Nag Hammadi and, and all the findings we've had, they didn't have any of that. But the small group of Gnostic texts they did have in the late 1800s were so influential, there was something called the French Gnostic Revival. Uh, and out of that grew something called the Gnostic Catholic Church or Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica. Nowadays, that's actually the ecclesiastical arm of OTO. So this Gnostic revival led to something that was absorbed by OTO, uh, and technically EGC, or Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, is that part of OTO that administers the Gnostic Mass. So next there's Egyptian myth and magic. Ancient Egyptian religion and mythology had a huge impact. There was this Egyptian revival, you can see it in all this Art Deco kind of faux Egyptian stuff back in the early 1900s, late 1800s. The Rosetta Stone only recently unlocked the un indecipherable mysteries of Egyptian hieroglyphics, and there was still very little known about them. A lot of speculation. Um, so people didn't know what hieroglyphs meant until very recently. Uh, this led to a lot of false claims. There's still a lot of false claims about Egypt, right? Tons of conspiracies about pyramids and all that. Um, but there was one Antoine Court de Gabelin in 1781 who claimed that the tarot was derived from ancient pictograms of Egyptian initiatory rites. Uh, since the language hadn't been translated yet, nobody could say he was wrong, right? But lots of these theories proliferated, that Egypt was the source of the mysteries, everything came from these pictographs in these chambers. How do we know? Because my imagination says it would be really cool for that to be true, basically. Uh, Crowley was very influenced by someone named uh, Budge, and he was an, Egyptolo an early Egyptologist who got a lot of things really wrong. Okay, so translations are wrong, uh, the, the names are weird and, and wrong, uh, but Crowley was greatly influenced by it. Uh, so, on the one hand, there was a lot, there's a lot of Egyptology that has cleaned things up since then. On the other hand, Crowley never claimed to be promoting a new Egyptian religion. Uh, for as much Egyptian imagery as part is part of his system, he never said this is the new, like a revival of Egyptian religion or anything like that. In fact, if anything, he said it's the revival of a Gnostic religion or a pagan religion. Uh, so he was influenced by the ideas, but he changed them. He took his own understanding and he used that understanding. Not necessarily a historically accurate one, but simply what he thought might be true and what he learned from the, the, the limited sources back then. So one of, the, one of Crowley's most important magical instructions called Liber Resh is a solar adoration that uses Egyptian figures. Uh, you make adorations to imagined, visualized versions of Egyptian sun gods. This is called the stele of revealing, and it's a central symbol or object of Philema. Uh, back in 1904, Crowley was hanging out in Cairo, Egypt. His wife started saying that there are gods waiting for him, uh, and he took her to a museum in Cairo and said, what god is, is you know, talking or wanting to speak with me. And she went, before she claimed, oh, it's, it's Horace, it's Horace that wants to talk to you. And Curly was like, ah, oh, she's crazy, right? I'll take her to the museum and she'll have to pick it out. But she doesn't know any Egyptology, she doesn't know a thing, right? She won't even know Horace from, from anything else. So they go to the museum, they walk past all, past all these depictions of Horace and he's laughing to himself out. She walked past Horace like five times. And she goes, there, that's him right there. And points to this stele in the Cairo Museum. And he walks over to it, and it's labeled as Stele 666, a number that he had took for himself as the Great Beast 666. Uh, and that struck him as incredibly significant. Uh, later, he received the Book of the Law, and this became one of the, the central symbols of Thelema. We'll talk about it a little bit more later, but as you can see, it is an actual Egypt, ancient Egyptian funerary Stele. If you ever go to a Gnostic Mass, you'll see a reproduction of it at the top of the altar. It's the top highest symbol in the Gnostic Mass, which is significant, um, the most important, and it's in every single Gnostic Mass temple across the world. So the Book of the Law is the central book of Philema, we'll come back to it, uh, but the three chapters are said to be dictated by Nuit, this figure arching over the top, 
The second chapter is dictated by Hadith, and third by Ra, or Kuit, sit, seated on the throne here. And this is Ankafna Kaumsu. Uh, this is his funerary stele dedicated to him. And he was a priest back in about 720 BC. Um, and Crowley, there is an identity drawn between him and Crowley in the Book of the Law, as if it's a kind of a past life or reflection of that time. Lots of interesting stuff there. Um, in the Egyptology of Crowley, there's really just not enough time to go through it. So, yoga, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Uh, it seems like this is a very often neglected subject by a lot of people, except uh, lately. But uh, most people seem to ignore that Crowley was huge into meditation. This is Crowley right here doing a mudra, meditating, kind of winking. I don't know, he's concentrating on something. Uh, and he wrote a book, Eight Lectures on Yoga, and one half, or one fourth of his giant book called Magic is purely about meditation and mysticism. Uh, it's a central foundational topic for Crowley, and he was greatly influenced by these traditions. So back in the early 1900s, Crowley visited his old magical mentor, his name was Alan Bennett, uh, in Ceylon, and he studied under a guru who taught him yoga. So he was out in like Sri Lanka learning yoga from a yogi. And this wasn't a guy in the 60s like picking up a pamphlet and trying things out. No one knew about this stuff, and he was going straight to the source and learning it. Uh, and he actually had an experience of dhyana, which is kind of a, one of the first results of meditation. Um, these ideas of yoga, of all Eastern things, were just beginning to be introduced by Sir Edwin Arnold uh, and Max Mueller, and especially in this series called The Sacred Texts of the East. Uh, many of them now are seen as incredibly inaccurate for the same reason Budge is seen as inaccurate. It was early stuff. They, we don't know, they didn't know nearly as much of the stuff as um, we know now. There's also kind of a, a veneer of like British exoticism that runs through them. That's, that's kind of funny uh, nowadays, but it's there. Um, Crowley was actually born the year the Theosophical Society was founded. And the Theosophical Society, founded by H.P. Blavatsky, it combined a lot of Eastern and Western ideas in a very haphazard way. Um, a lot of them were kind of Blavatsky's impressions of what she thinks she would like the Eastern ideas to say, it seems. Um, but the main thing is Theosophy didn't really practice anything. They just talked a lot about yoga. Crowley was almost obsessive about the practice of yoga. If you ever read his letters, it's always about shut up and do the work. So stop talking, stop thinking about the theory, stop asking me questions, just sit down and meditate. Just get to work. So Crowley integrated in particular the system of Raja Yoga into his system of magic. And that's a, a system of meditation based on eight, eight limbs. There's Yama and Niyama, a kind of ethics of do's and don'ts. Then there's posture, regularization of breathing, introspection, focus on an object, and so on. Um, all these things are pretty familiar to people who know about meditation nowadays, these elements. Um, but he kind of took this particular breed and fused it into his version of magic. So if you've ever read the, read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, that is particularly his breed of yoga. We'll talk a little bit about that more later. Crowley also thought it was a very important achievement that he identified the I Ching with the tree of life. He thought this was a very important thing that showed the systems were essentially identical at the base of it. Uh, can't even begin to get into why this is cool or you'd have to understand both systems to really get it. Uh, but I, I encourage you to uh, read 777 where uh, this di diagram comes from and at least begin the, <laughs> the journey of trying to understand those correspondences. So you'll also find tons of concepts from Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, yoga, and Taoism. So the last one, the last main influence is his own influence, the holy books of Philema that he supposedly received. He, he received the Book of the Law, that's the term he used, 
and he was inspired to write the other holy books of Philema. These are basically the central texts of the Philemic religious tradition or philosophical tradition. Um, it's taught that they shouldn't be changed by even a single letter because uh, they kind of came from a source above the rational mind and the rational mind wants to constantly criticize and change things uh, but there's there is an injunction injunction in the book of law saying change not even the style of a letter don't touch it just leave it as is um, the book of the law is usually published with the man the original manuscript you can see Crowley scribbling the original book in the back of most copies of the book of the law because he wanted to preserve the original writing and show that it hadn't been tampered like the Bible had been tampered with through many, many translations and so on. Okay. So uh, class A is what these holy books are called. There's various classes of texts that Crowley had, um, but he basically categorized every single book or writing that he did by a number and a name. And as you might guess, every single number is capitalistically significant. So each of his books have different classifications and numbers. Uh, class A refers to only those books that are holy books that are received or inspired and you don't touch them at all. There's class B where he talks about enlightened scholarship. Uh, you know, C, class C is suggestive materials. Class D are all the rituals. Class E is all the outreach materials. Uh, he just kind of organized all of his stuff himself to show there's different types of texts that should be treated in different ways. Uh, the Book of the Law of Philema is the central text of Philema. So here are the main inspirations to Crowley, Western Magic, Kabbalah, the kind of Masonic tradition, Templar Masonic tradition, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Egyptian myth and magic, yoga, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism, and Philema. Any questions about that stuff that's just burning in your mind that you want to ask? Have I totally bewildered you? Good. Good question. Maybe it's more technical. I don't know, but what's the difference between magic with just a C and the K at the end? That's a great question, yeah. So Curly actually specifically put a K at the end, which is actually a throwback to early English or Old English. Um, but he wanted to distinguish it from stage magic and the kind of illusion work that is associated with the word magic. Some people actually pronounce it differently as magic to even further separate it from stage magic. Uh, but he said he was kind of reviving this ancient primitive tradition of magic. And he was using this new term to kind of set it apart from everything else. Does that make sense? Anything else? That burning in your loins. Should have that checked out. <laughs>